Hello everybody, this is Hammer Striker here. Today I've got the latest from the M&P lineup, the M&P 5.7, which is also the latest in the 5.7 pistols that have come out. Please don't forget to check out our website. Go to our affiliates page. You'll find discount codes for things like Mantis Axe and Core Belts. Link to that cool little bore light that we use for lighting up the barrels. Use those links. It will often save you money, never will cost you any additional money, and helps the channel. Thank you. This is it kind of completes the M&P lineup as far as calibers. The 5.7 cartridge has been getting a lot of the popularity that 10 millimeter has been enjoying as well. And it went from if you wanted a 5.7 pistol, it was going to be an FN, to now you've got the M&P from Smith & Wesson, you've got the PSA Rock, the Ruger, as well as the latest from FN, their updated version of it. And they've all got their advantages and disadvantages. This one has an MSRP of $699, so it's reasonably priced, kind of right in the middle of the pack for pricing, significantly less expensive than the FN, a little bit more expensive than the PSA. It's got a four-slot Picatinny rail, does have a threaded barrel. One thing about M&P lineup, normally you don't need tools to do anything with it. Unfortunately, this one you do need tools for a couple things. You need tools for the takedown, I'll show you that, and you need a tool if you want that thread protector off. You're going to need to use a 9 16 12 point, either a wrench or a socket, if you want that thread protector off of there. That's kind of a disadvantage. Most of them use a O-ring for retention, so you really don't need tools to remove them. Under there, it is a threaded barrel, so you can put a muzzle device of your choice on there, but just know that you're either going to need to bring a tool with you or prepare it before you leave the house. It does have an interesting barrel system I'll show when I get in there. From a dimension standpoint, all of the 5.7s are basically a full size. This one's five and a quarter inches tall. It's 8.5 inches front to back, but it's very thin. It's only 1.1 inches thick. So it is really thin compared to the others in the M&P lineup, as well as other 5.7s, which also gives you a very thin grip. Without any replaceable back straps, depending on the size of your hand, that may or may not be an advantage, because the 5.7 grip is long front to back. The magazines are long front to back. While the round is long, it's a little, kind of a little rifle round. And this magazine, it comes with two of these, holds 22 rounds, nice steel magazine, well constructed. Unfortunately, there is no magazine cross compatibility between, let's say, the PSA and the Ruger or the FN. And that, they're on their own with this. This magazine fits just the five, the Smith & Wesson M&P and neither magazines are interchangeable back and forth. But with that kind of a pattern on the grip, the design of the grip, it's kind of odd to hold. And that's kind of true of all of the 5.7s. The little bit fatter ones give you a little bit more normal feeling grip and that can affect your ability to hold it and shoot it well. Mechanically, it is seems to be very accurate. It worked well. It was reliable. It did a decent job of stabilizing all of the rounds. The little 27 grain blue tip that a lot of guns won't stabilize. This stabilized mostly, but it did have a couple instances where you kind of got a flyer. It did pull nice groups. Part of the reason it pulled nice groups is it has an, actually a very good trigger. So it does have the toggle, inertial toggle for as part of the safeties. There's a minimal amount of take up. It's very light and then a super short crisp break. It is internally hammer fired and it has a trigger that would be consistent with a nice single action trigger. It's a very, very, very nice trigger and it's, it comes in less than four pounds. Reset is super, super short. Now it's kind of about a third of the way of all the way out, but all the way out is not a lot of travel to begin with. So I'm gonna do that again. Right on the wall and then a super short crisp break the trigger is really, really good on this. Of all the various 5.7s that are out there, starting with the battle trigger that's in the FN, all the way to the decent trigger that's in the PSA, this beats them all. This trigger is just much smoother and much nicer. And then all the way back out again. So when I look at which one has the best trigger, it's definitely this one. And that trigger does help you stay on target. You do have to pay attention a little bit. It would be easy if you're not paying attention to get a second shot that you weren't expecting, but it is a very nice trigger and it does have an internal drop safety and there is an ambi thumb safety available. This one doesn't have it, but if it did, it would be right back here and it would be also on the other side. 
and you'll notice while I've got it flipped over, the slide stop slide release is ambi. So if you get the thumb safety, it's gonna be ambi. Without it, of course, you just have the blanks there. And at least they do put the blanks in so there's not a gap there. The sights are quite nice. They're steel three dot white sights that really stand out well, easy to see, enough of a gap between them so it's easy to find your target. And it is optics ready. This optics ready does come with a little bit of a negative though. It is designed to not use plates, so the optic will sit right on the slide when you mount it, but it's a little bit shorter than most of the optics, and it's set up for one optic pattern. I'm thinking it's the tri Trigicon pattern, but I haven't had a chance to confirm that. There are a couple optics I've heard that will fit on this. The Smith & Wesson video pictures it with a Holosun EBS carry, but before I name optics that'll fit on this, I want to get real confirmation from Smith & Wesson of what they know will fit. And I want to tell you something, have you go spend 500 bucks buy an optic and have it not fit. But this is not going to be compatible with every optic out there. And it may not be compatible with your favorite optic, despite their marketing tagline, because it's a little bit shorter and it's got one pattern and that's it. And kind of to that point, I've got the 10 millimeter, which is optics ready. And I'm gonna close this. You can see the 10 millimeter is much wider. So more optics would of course fit on the 10, 10 millimeter without hanging off. But additionally, you can see that the optics cut on the 10 millimeter is longer. And if you pull this plate off, it's a different pattern than this one. So if you look at a couple optics that are advertised to fit the MMP series, they might fit this, but they probably won't fit that. So you're gonna to have to be careful until a little more information comes out in choosing an optic for this because it would be easy to get one and have it not fit. On both of these designs, the cover is plastic, which is fine. There's no real stress or anything on the cover and the cover does come off when you're gonna put an optic on it. So that really doesn't hurt anything. As far as the slide and the barrel material, it's stainless steel. As I mentioned, the barrel is threaded, and it also has a system called the Tempo system, which I'll show you how it works when I get it apart. But it's kind of a unique barrel system, and it's different than all of the others that are out there, you know, from the FN and on. It did work well, it did work reliably. As far as recoil management, there's no recoil on 5.7 anyway. So I really didn't notice any recoil difference between them. And you also do have front and rear serrations. The slides on these are relatively light. And of course, the first pull is a little bit heavier till you cock the hammer, and then after that, it's even lighter. So when you talk about light racks, some of the guns that we've talked about, this one might fit into that category of being relatively easy to rack. And from a recoil perspective, non-existent. The only thing with somebody with a weaker hand, the size of the shape of the grip might be a bit of an issue. But other than that, the gun does work well and is comfortable to hold. And just for clarity, when I was talking about pull, the first ball on the slide that cocks the hammer, this is an SA under the hood, so it will only work if the hammer is cocked. So it has to have cycled, cocks the hammer. So the trigger is consistent every single pull, but the slide gets lighter after the first time you pull it because it has cocked the hammer, so there's a little less work to do. But, and again, this would actually probably be a good choice for people with limited hand strength. Now these things are loud, but other than that, they actually are a very effective round, and it's not a round I want to be on the business end of. So now I'm going to talk about disassembly, and this is where the Smith & Wesson takes a, a kind of a negative. You need a tool. Now this is a Glock disassembly tool, and kind of one thing I'll say, if, even if you never will own a Glock in your life, if you completely despise Glocks and want nothing to do with them, buy a Glock disassembly tool because the punch size of it is pretty much works on everything. It's useful for a lot of stuff. With a plastic handle, these are about eight bucks and it avoids you having to buy a punch set. And this is actually pretty durable. But the negative is you have to take this back and line up that little half moon. Then you have to clamp it with your hand so you get it lined up, you clamp it with your hand, you have to keep it clamped, then you turn the thing over, and you have to push this pin out, which does actually come out pretty easily. Now you have part removed from the gun, and then you have to take it apart, and it may not come apart, of course this time it did, but sometimes if the barrel gets moved a little bit or the recoil spring gets moved a little bit, it can hang up, so you may have to play with it a little bit. 
does have a clunky takedown procedure and I do take points off for that. I do that on every gun. They have basically there's three other guns, four other guns in this category. All of them are tool list disassembly, so why does this one need a tool? Now one of the positives I'll give them credit for is that most threaded barrels you have to remove the thread protector to take the barrel out of the slide. This one you don't. It comes out as a unit. This is factory torqued and as I mentioned earlier you need a wrench if you want to remove it which is good that you don't have to take it off to get the barrel out. If you're never going to put a muzzle device on it you never have to mess with this. So I'm going to set the barrel aside for just a moment and then I'm going to talk about the uh, slide itself. The slide is actually quite simple because it is hammer fired. There's the cutout for the hammer to hit the firing pin. There is the drop safety plunger right there. So it is designed to be drop safe. And of course with the inertial toggle and the optional thumb safety, this is designed to be safe to carry. And this is a carryable weapon, but it, given the fact that it's a full size, so it would be similar to carrying a Glock 17 or an XDM 3.8 or something like that. But it's well machined. And one thing I failed to mention earlier there are some cuts in the slide. Now, I'm not aware of any ported barrels for any of the 5.7s, and you could not do it with this one, and I'll show you why in a moment. So this is more decoration than anything. It's not enabling a ported barrel, but you really don't need a ported barrel on a 5.7. There's no recoil to manage. Captive guide rod and spring. It is steel, and it's kind of a wafer spring. Set that aside, and here is the frame. So you have guide, ra guide rails at the back, kind of got a decent length guide rails at the front. Fire control group, here's your hammer, because again I mentioned it's an internal hammer fired gun. Well machined, clean, same with the slide, it's, it's really clean. And these, these, by the way, these cutouts probably also lighten the slide enough to help it function correctly. Here's where this is different than the rest of them, this barrel. So they call it the tempo barrel system and it's got a rotating component. So it rotates and the barrel comes out and it kind of looks like the Elder Wand from Harry Potter. But what this is, is actually this is a gas operated. So it uses a piston and the barrel's the piston. So I'm holding the barrel and the piston in my hand. And right there is the gas port. Now with the gas port all the way down there at the end, there is no gas pressure attempting to open this. It's locked at this point till the bullet passes the gas port and then it's only fractions of a second before it's out the barrel. So the bullet will, once it clears the gas port, then gas pressure can start to charge this piston and start the cycling the gun. So effectively what happens is you don't have this opening anywhere in the early part of it. There's no early opening. You don't get gas blown in your face and stuff like that. It's actually kind of a very interesting design. Now a lot of times you would use the the design like this to mitigate recoil, but there's no recoil to mitigate on this, so that's not really part of it. And you'll notice I mentioned it's a threaded barrel. I got the barrel. It's not threaded. The threads are on the shroud. This shroud is actually robust enough to hold the muzzle device and be part of the system. So you've got your shroud threaded. When this thing is assembled, effectively you've got a threaded barrel. Well, I've got this thing in my hand. I will show you the rifling. It's kind of hard to see because it's this is a 22 caliber barrel. 5.7 is a 22 caliber round. But it's well machined, conventional rifling. And the feed ramp on these 5.7s is usually wide or at a good part of the barrel. You'll see it's kind of a pretty good flare here. So it's designed to feed well. This fed everything we fed it. We fed it uh, the uh, assortment of FN 5.7 rounds and all of them fed ran reliably, cycled properly, ejected properly. To reassemble the barrel, put this thing in, and you put it with these two notches facing up and just pivot this little protrusion in and then the barrel's reassembled. And it'll center itself correctly when I actually put it back into the gun. Put it back into the slide. And it goes in easy. There's no difficulties with the thread protector. And then center this. Now, if I get this right and I get the barrel up and down correctly, when I go to put it back on the frame, it'll go on easily. If not, I may have to play with it a little bit to get it to come back together. And what ends up happening when I do these videos, it either just works or it gives me a bunch of trouble. But now that I've got it back together, I need to realign that, drop this pin back in. And by the way, you see this little gear? 
This is similar to what they did with the CSX. Now the only difference between this and the CSX, on the CSX you actually had to use a hammer to push the pin out. With this it just hand pressure did it. But you have to make sure that when you put this together, if it doesn't want to go, don't force it. If you damage this little gear splines, then you're going to have trouble with it staying correctly put together. But if you get it lined up just right, it just pops in real easy. And then you're back in business. So again, i got to take away points for the takedown procedure. The other manufacturers have figured out how to have toolless takedown, either a little pull-down tabs or pull-back tab. One partial exception to that is this Ruger, which I've got right here. And the Ruger has this flip thing, which, of course, that would appear to be toolless. But you do have to push this in, which you can kind of push it with your finger. But you, you don't actually need a punch, though. You can actually use your cleaning tool for that. So I kind of like half point off for this, because this does at least stay attached. And once you push it forward, you can flip it down. But also, look how much thinner the 5.7 is than the Ruger. So you can really kind of see the difference in the thickness of the 5.7 from Smith & Wesson versus the Ruger and the others. The others are about the same thickness. And you'll see that it's a little bit smaller than the Ruger in the body. And actually when you line the whole thing up beaver tail to beaver tail, the entire thing with threaded barrel is about the same length, maybe a hair shorter than the Ruger. And the grips are roughly the same height. Now it's going to be kind of hard to do this because I've got to try to line them up. But the grips are roughly the same height. You know, fractions of an inch. The grip height and difference isn't going to make a difference. This thing's got a red dot on it, so it's a little more work to line them up properly. So you've got a little bit, little bit smaller in all dimensions, especially thickness, which of course matters. Thickness matters when you're trying to conceal carry it and hide it. This comes in at 30.9 ounces with an empty mag installed. And I try to consistently do weight with the empty mag, not just the pistol. It's about 27.6, I think, with the pistol itself, and then 3 point something for the mag. But it comes in about 30.9 with the combination of an empty mag and the gun, and of course you add your ammo. 5.7 doesn't weigh much, so the difference when you fully load this 22 round mag magazine is almost insignificant. Another positive for the Smith & Wesson is it doesn't have the dreaded magazine disconnect you find on a couple of these. I hate those. This doesn't have it. It just has the, the safeties that make sense, make it drop safe. Beyond that, I really do think this is a nice gun. The biggest negative to it, I would say, is the takedown. As far as the tool required for the barrel protector, if you're going to put an optic on it, or not an optic, a muzzle device on it, you use the tool once, you put your device on, and that'll be the end of that. And the optic, though it's kind of strange, it's going to be kind of the similar thing. You find an optic that works on it, you buy that optic and stick it on there, and this kind of weirdness isn't going to matter. The disadvantage to the whole optic realm right now is there's no real standard. Everybody's got their own idea of what's best, so there's that's why you need all the different plates and everything else. Maybe we'll get lucky someday and that whole optics realm will standardize and there'll just be an optics mount and that'll be the end of that. And the only other thing I found is the videos that Smith & Wesson put out and their website offered no help whatsoever. I'm actually going to have to call them to find out what they know fits on this. And when I do get an optic that fits on it, I'll do an update to the video. Beyond that, if you like our videos, please give us a thumbs up, share, subscribe, check us out on Facebook, Utreon, Patreon, Instagram, Twitter, Rumble, kind of everywhere. And thank you.